I am very happy to welcome you all to today's Copy with Curiosity. This is a monthly lecture series which I started about a year ago, aimed at students and members of public. Jawaharlal Nehru Planetarium is a unique institution engaged in dissemination of science amongst uh, public and students. Every year we attract over two and a half lakh visitors to our popularization program and hundreds of students attend our non-formal science education. We cater to wide range of uh, age group starting from third standard, fourth standard to BSEs and hundreds of uh, students uh, attend these programs and a large number of them have pursued PhD and they are doing research in various research institutes. Our association with ICTS has resulted in bringing eminent scientists to address student community and general public. We have had several uh, uh, lectures in the last one year on diverse uh, fields. And today, today's speaker, Professor Harmit Malik, is an eminent scientist. Today he is going to talk about paleovirology. I extend a very warm welcome to you, sir. I extend very warm welcome to distinguished guests here, Professor Nagraj, Professor D. N. Rao, and Professor Murthy of IAA who is here amongst us. And a hearty welcome to all of you again. Now I request Professor Rajesh Gopukumar to say a few words about ICTS. Thank you, Dr. Pramod. Uh, as always, it's a very great pleasure to be here for these Copy with Curiosity events. Uh, as uh, Dr. Pramod said, we have been having this uh, very fruitful partnership for the last year or so in which uh, we have had topics over a very, I mean, ranging over, I think, the entire range of the sciences uh, from uh, the very small to the very big to the very complex to the very abstract, everything. Uh, so uh, uh, so I, uh, this is an initiative of the ICTS in partnership with the planetarium uh, and uh, sometimes uh, other institutions as well uh, to bring the excitement of science to uh, the general public, uh, and we are very happy that a large number of distinguished scientists have agreed to take part in this. Uh, and further, this one of the novel features, uh, uh, many of you have been here for our previous events, but one of the novel features of uh, Copy with Curiosity is that we keep a very large uh, time uh, after the lecture for question and answers, for discussions. So the idea is that people get to uh, uh, get to ask uh, uh, and uh, really interact in a uh, direct way with the scientists. Uh, uh, and this has been really, I think, uh, taken up uh, very uh, enthusiastically by the audience. Uh, I, I'm sure in this um, uh, talk as well, we will have uh, a lot of uh, lot of questions, and I think that makes it unique and very lively. We've even had people who are watching it live streamed and asking questions uh, online. Uh, um, uh, I think last copy with curiosity was the one we started live streaming, and I believe this one is also going to be live streamed. And uh, so you might have questions from somewhere around the world. Last time there were people from Budapest and so on who were attending uh, online. Uh, anyway, um, I just wanted to also say a little bit about ICTS. So apart, uh, so. Uh, uh, Harmeet and many of the other scientists in our Copy with Curiosity program uh, come to ICTS as part of our programs uh, 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 which we host, uh, which bring together scientists from around the world and the scientists and younger researchers from India uh, to, uh, to have uh, uh, intense sort of uh, workshops, discussions, collaborations in a variety of topics in the theoretical sciences. Uh, so from bi theoretical quantitative biology, theoretical physics, mathematics, uh, theoretical computer science and so on. Uh, sometimes some are in the nature of schools and at the moment there is a winter school going on in quantitative biology and that's uh, where Professor Malik is uh, a visitor for. But uh, sometimes these are long discussion meetings for people to collaborate. We have a variety of formats of programs at ICTS uh, and um, uh, 
you can look at our web page and all the talks from these programs are archived forever. So you have programs from 2007 onwards on a variety of topics. If you are curious about something, very likely you will find an ICTS lecture course on the topic uh, at varying levels of detail and uh, depth. Uh, so, uh, and we also have our own researchers who have been uh, stellar in a number of areas of uh, the theoretical sciences that I mentioned. Uh, and um, there are a lot of public lectures and events that we hold in ICTS itself. Uh, so in early January, for instance, uh, you, many of you may want to come to hear Kip Thon, this year's Nobel laureate in gravitational wave physics. He will be speaking on the 11th of January at ICTS campus. Uh, it's in the north of Bangalore, but uh, I'm sure the trip will be worth it. Uh, on the 7th of January, there is a public lecture at the Christ University Auditorium on the usefulness of useless knowledge by Robert Digraf, the, uh, uh, the director of the Institute for Advanced Study at Princeton. It will be followed by a panel discussion with uh, Manjul Bhargava, David Gross, um, uh, Jennifer Chase uh, of Microsoft uh, Research, uh, uh, Mr. Narayan Murthy, the founder of Infosys, uh, and um, uh, Mr. Uh, Professor Vijay Raghavan uh, from NCBS. Uh, on, uh, on the importance of fundamental science, the usefulness of useless, so-called so useless knowledge. Uh, and uh, so I invite all of you to come for these public events. And, uh, and on the 14th of January, we will also have an event here, which will also be advertised uh, on uh, the man from nine dimensions. Uh, but uh, so there are lots of events for the holiday season uh, lined up for you. Uh, but I won't take more of your time. I'll uh, uh, hand it over to Vijay who will introduce the speaker to you. So thank you again to everyone uh, for coming. Thank you, Rajesh. So this is a brief introduction to the speaker. So Harmit did his uh, bachelor's in chemical engineering from IIT Bombay. So he just uh, was telling me he had never done biology until then. Then he moved into biology, went to Rochester, got a PhD there, and then went to the Fred Hutchinson Center for Cancer Research for a postdoc, and then stayed there and is doing fantastic work. So like Rajesh said, he's actually visiting ICTS as part of the Winter School on Quantitative Systems Biology, where he'll be lecturing for the next few days. So Harmeet's uh, research concerns evolutionary conflicts, which we'll talk about more, conflicts at the level of the genome, genome protein, and so on. So a, set of, a fantastic set of ideas that he has been discovering are, are just amazing to watch. Just to watch his other YouTube videos as well. So I won't take much time. I'll invite him. And uh, I'll also invite Professor Nagaraja to hand over a memento uh, to the speaker on behalf of both ICTS and the planetarium. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah. So I was told that this is a very informal setting. So uh, given that there's not necessarily a set agenda for me to like describe everything that I have planned to tell you, I would strongly request, urge you to interrupt me, right? So if there's a question that, that came up, please raise your hand. If I didn't see you, just shout out. It's totally fine. I was told by the organizers it's actually also encouraged. It will also make sure that everybody is on the same page, because if you have a clarification question, chances are many of your friends do as well, but they're too shy to ask. So with that, uh, maybe wait until I start talking, and then you can ask a question. That would be even better. Uh, OK, so I'm actually going to start off with a little bit of a digression and sort of talk about concepts of time, especially when it applies to uh, the sciences like biology. So uh, to do this, I've uh, illustrated uh, the Grand Canyon, which is uh, one of those amazing things that you sort of really have to experience to appreciate the scale of the Grand Canyon. There's uh, lots of places in India also where if you sort of watch from a bird's eye view, it really sort of emphasizes how much time it took for nature to carve all of these crevices from what was essentially a flat land. I mean, this, these, these go on for hundreds of miles. So what's the estimate? Like, how long do you think it took for the Colorado River to craft the Grand Canyon? This is the part where you can guess. And it'd be fine if you're off even by an order of magnitude. I was. Uh, a million years, excellent, uh, excellent guess. You're totally in the right ballpark. So, so maybe another guess in that range. 
Okay, so uh, people don't agree completely, as in scientists, but the range is between 6 to 16 million years, right? So you can look at this as a glass, glass half full is like, wow, there's a lot of time. Of course, they were able to craft all of this stuff. But I mean, once you appreciate the scale, you realize it's this, uh, it's this time that has allowed this crafting of this amazing sort of geological formation to take place. And th this is an appreciation of time. From a biology standpoint, Six million years is like literally a drop in the bucket. And people in astrophysics would concede that it's less than a drop in the bucket in the context of the age of the universe. So this sort of leads me to one of my favorite quotes about thinking about time when you think about biology. Because one of the, one of the sort of intuitions where human intuition actually fails is to actually appreciate how much time has happened, how much time has been available for biological innovation and adaptation to occur, for us to see the range of species and the range of novelties that we see on the planet today. Right? So we estimate, and again, uh, there's some uh, debate about this, but we estimate that the first life forms appeared 3.5 million years ago. And we estimate that the first sort of multicellular animals that we discover and can easily recognize without the aid of the microscope uh, appeared around 600 million years ago to 700 million years ago. And that has led to this uh, dramatic expansion of multicellular life forms. There's a much greater expansion of unicellular life forms, which we don't appreciate until, unless we have an access to a microscope. But nonetheless, even this tell, tells you there's been a lot of time for innovation to occur. And this sort of appreciation for the multiple scales of biology where you have a lot of innovation that can occur over broad swaths of time, but also a lot of innovation that can occur very, very short windows of time is one of the sort of take home lessons that I'd like you to leave here today, that there has been a lot of time in some sense for a lot of adaptation to occur, but also a lot of time for a lot of junk to accumulate. If you uh, have the packing philosophy that I do, unlike my wife, the greater you've lived in a place, the more stuff has accumulated. You have no idea what's in many of the boxes that you've put away. The human genome is a lot like that. And I, one of, that's one of the sort of biggest appreciations that comes out of the analysis of the human genome is there's a lot of stuff in there. And most of it is actually not doing anything human, so to speak. So this leads me to the topic of my uh, lecture today, which is paleovirology, or the study of ancient viruses. And I just modified it a little bit because I'd like to talk about two aspects in particular, ghosts of ancient viruses and gifts of ancient viruses, uh, both of which are sort of really relevant to how we think about the impact of ancient viruses on human biology, but also on biology in general. Uh, to illustrate that, I'm showing you the mummified head of Ramses V, the discovery of uh, you know, mummies in Egypt was one of the greatest sort of archaeological discoveries of our time. Uh, it's not necessarily believed to be the, one of the greatest medical discoveries of our time, but people who actually study smallpox uh, quickly recognize when the mummy was made av available for scrutiny that it's pretty clear that uh, Ramses was afflicted with smallpox and most likely died of smallpox because of the classical pustules that you associate with death due to smallpox infection. Now, nowhere in recorded history is it actually said that Ramses V was afflicted or died because of smallpox. This is an inference that we are making. But it's likely true, given what we know about where smallpox was raging at the time. And this was in about uh, 1100 BC. So human history is really profound, depending on perspective. But again, thinking about this biological time scale is actually really, really, really tiny window into the time that has actually elapsed. And our sort of window of human history and the impact that pathogens can have um, is really well illustrated by this slide, which is a slide of a relatively recent slide in 2016 about the impact of one pathogen, HIV, and the sort of global impact into the number uh, of cases that we can see uh, among adults between 15 to 49. And you can see there are large parts of the world that are still strongly afflicted by the HIV pathogen. I'll just also emphasize that HIV, uh, we've, we've lost a little bit of appreciation, which is a little scary, because uh, triple cocktail therapy is really working. And at least in developed countries, we feel that we have a good handle on the disease. But it has been estimated as recently as last month that even in a country such as the United States, which has access to all of these medicines, 
Uh, for every one person who gets onto antiretroviral therapy, there are two people who get new patients who get affected by HIV. So we are nowhere close to winning this war, and only really a vaccine is going to pro provide the sort of type of impact that will allow a worldwide relief. Um, now, surprisingly, because this is such a young virus, we estimate HIV uh, only sort of really entered the human species about 150 years ago. If you sort of appreciate that, it occurred, we believe, in Kinshasa, uh, which is sort of one of these uh, densely populated areas of the Congo, and that has led to this profound impact that we see today. This is what we are talking about in terms of a pathogen impact and how profoundly it can actually impact a species. Uh, there are, of course, other pathogens that we've encountered that have also left a huge impact in the, in the genome. Uh, I talked about HIV here. We've had a continuous impact of the dengue virus, which has basically afflicted and caused uh, fitness consequences. Smallpox, which is a relatively ancient virus, that uh, one of the case studies where we've actually controlled a virus in a global sort of eradication campaign. Polio, which we've come very, very close on at least three occasions, and every time we come really, really close, uh, it's actually human politics rather than biology that actually takes over, right? And it's actually one of those cases where we've uh, really sort of failed ourselves as a species uh, rather than saying that the scientists have failed us. This is one of those cases where you cannot assign the blame to the scientists. Um, now, keeping in mind what I was telling you about biological time scale, this is still a very, very, very shallow time scale. This is all of human recorded history. We can have the 1918 flu here. These are all cases where we expect that there was enough of a profound impact on human populations that some adaptation or signatures of adaptation to like survive this pathogen must have occurred. You could talk about European populations and the Black Plague exactly in the same vein. Today, yeah. This is what we believe uh, based on uh, estimates of its uh, diversity when it has been sampled from things like museum specimens, et cetera. We can estimate how uh, long a pathogen has been infecting the human population based on the genetic diversity that it accumulated in the course of that. Uh, uh, that's a very good question. So, so first bonus points for the first question. I would really encourage you to uh, continue interrupting me. Today I'm actually gonna tell you about a different record, which is not recorded human history per se, but a record from our own genome of viral invasions that have occurred. And we'll refer to these as fossils of viruses that have occurred. And I'm gonna to refer to them also as ERVs or endogenous retroviruses. And that's because a class of viruses which HIV belongs to, including retroviruses, absolutely have to make an imprint in the genome when they infect an organism. So here's one example of the life cycle of a virus. A virus enters, it negotiates with a receptor protein, which is a host protein. Based on this interaction, it will enter the cell, enter the cytoplasm of the cell, which is sort of the cellular milieu, eventually make it to the nucleus where it actually integrates itself into the host genome. And this step is absolutely required because it's actually this integrated version of the virus that is going to make daughter viruses. So this is a very unique sort of aspect of the life cycle of retroviruses because unlike other viruses where they can use this entering virus to make daughter viruses, retroviruses absolutely have to make an imprint in the host genome and then use that imprint to go on to make daughter viruses. So what that means is that an uh, infectious virus, something that actually existed in the environment, could infect let's say koala species, but also then leave an imprint in the genome of the koala species such that that particular virus is now transmitted in two ways. It is both transmitted as an infectious exogenous virus, something from outside the body, but it is also transmitted as an endogenous virus where mom passes on this virus that is integrated in her own genome onto our daughter progeny. And this is now uh, sort of an insidious mechanism because this is, of course, now part of the genome and can become rapidly fixed within the species. I didn't pick koalas for just uh, aesthetic purposes. Indeed, such an invasion has just occurred. Parallel to the invasion of human species by the HIV, there was a second invasion of the koala genome by this endogenous retrovirus. 
And so if you basically take this uh, ge geological expedition down the sort of uh, eastern coast of Australia, which scientists such as uh, Rachel Tarlington and Paul Young have done, you find that as you go from the eastern parts of Australia, you find almost 100% infection of koala viruses by this endogenous virus. In some cases, this virus is present in between 20 to 100 copies in the genome of the koala uh, species. But as you go over, you have now this isolated population on Kangaroo Island, which at least in 2012, there were no infections at all, whether exogenous or endogenous. What that means is that we have this inescapable sort of uh, path of this particular retrovirus invading the species to the point where it will eventually become a species fixed determinant. And this has all happened in recorded human history in the last 100 years, right? So this is an example where 100 new integration events have shaped the koala genome. And these integration events have actually come from an exogenous, what previously used to be an infectious virus. And this virus has now adapted its lifestyle to be passed on from mom to offspring in subsequent generations. Question, I'll get, I'll get to the questions, yeah. It is obvious the, that it has passed through the germline, at least in a couple of cases, yes, because the envelope gene, which is required for infection, has decayed in some of these viruses. And so either they're hijacking other envelope genes, which we'll get to what that means in a second, or they're actually just re simply replicating as other forms of selfish DNA in terms of their replicative cycle. But whether all of the transmission is because of endogenous viruses or exogenous viruses, the best sort of evidence is that you can actually make a evolutionary history of the viral imprints themselves. And we have an evolutionary sort of uh, sampling of what the exogenous viruses look like. It actually turns out that some of the endogenous viruses that are sort of replicating are a completely different class or subset of the exogenous viruses. And they're probably daughter viruses of the original endogenous virus that actually entered. Does that answer your question? Okay, there was a question in the back, yeah. Are these, are these viral genomes necessarily junk DNA or are they expressed in some cases? Yeah, so most of them are too recent to accumulate junk. We're gonna spend a lot of time today talking about junk DNA and what that means. Uh, well, as far as the koala genome is concerned, <laughs> They probably are junk or even worse parasitic DNA, right? Because they're increasing at the expense of potentially koala fitness. But they're not junk DNA per se because they're completely capable of basically making new viruses, which is why they're basically persisting. So again, it, it comes down to your definition of what junk DNA means. To me, junk DNA simply means has lost all potential to be coding uh, and, and therefore is now a junk. But a parasite, parasite by definition would not be considered junk because it's capable of coding. There's a question in front. And, uh, you know, does, do the cells, like TP53 in the human genome, right? Like it will try to correct, uh, I mean, it's not really a replication error here, but it's like, you know. I think, I think, I'll, I'll, let me just rephrase your question. What you're asking is, this is clearly an, a foreign invader of the genome. How come it's not being recognized as one? So these viruses are successful because they've been able to bypass those host defenses. So. The koalas are facing a number of viruses, certain number of them broken through those defenses, and so these are what we would refer to as well-adapted viruses, which is why they're broken through. Similarly, HIV has broken through a number of human defenses, but SIV, for instance, from CPZ, has not, and so this is a, this is a form of viral adaptation, not is so it, much the fact that the humans have not adapted. Is it almost like a race on both sides? Because it's a race. I'm actually going to come to that slide okay. in a second. Yes. Because the, once it succeeds, uh, and let, let's say it mates with a, with a koala which didn't have, get attacked, like is there some sort of evolutionary defense mechanism so that the offspring, uh, you know, is less susceptible than the one parent which did get uh, breached? Yes, sort of. I, think, I think what you're getting at is that over the course of an infection, as you sort of are encountering more and more uninfected, uh, do you have an advantage to the deleterious effects of this virus if you happen to be infected in the first place because you've now developed some sort of 
uh, either uh, tolerance or immunity. Uh, in the koala genome, it's unclear. In other genomes, like in rabbits, it's very clear. Infected rabbits are better off in the face of an infection because their immune system has already been trained to recognize the most pathological aspects of these viruses. Yeah. Okay, I think. Yeah, so I think this is related to that question. Is the high copy number, oh uh, yeah. How is the high copy number possible? Uh, uh, the high copy number is because of two reasons. One is because some new imprints are being made by exogenous viruses, but it's also because the uh, step at which these endogenous viruses are replicating happens to be a step that's especially vulnerable to retroviral attack, which is during the formation of eggs and sperm. And so that is basically a particular vulnerable step. Meiosis happens, there's lots of double-stranded breaks, and there's a lot of opportunities for new retroviral invasions. I wasn't actually getting into that, but that's a particularly sort of weak point, if you will, in the host defense. That's true of all mammals, yeah. Okay, so one of the most big surprises when we looked in the human genome is we can exactly see a similar thing than to the koala genome. Except in this case, because there's been so much uh, amazing preservation of biological information, we can see not just one invasion, but waves upon waves upon uh, waves of inf uh, invasion of retroviruses practically at every stage of simian primate evolution. Just to give you a sense, this is about 60 million years of evolution. This is not to say that all retroviruses came into being here. There are probably retroviral invasions that go back even older uh, in fact, the, the oldest retroviral invasion of any genome is in the coelocanth, and that's about 600 million years old, almost as old as sort of uh, bony vertebrates. However, our ability to recognize these decays, and I'll explain that uh, with time. So this is not so much the fact that biology hasn't occurred uh, except in the last 60 million years. Our ability to recognize that biology is somewhat obscured by the fact that these events are really old. So I'm actually going to focus primarily on these events that have occurred in the last 60 million years because these have occurred recently enough that we can actually precisely date these insertions. We know, for instance, that an insertion that occurred here has been inherited in the genomes of all of the primates, whereas an insertion that occurred here is actually only present in human, chimp, and gorilla genomes. So depending on where they occurred, they've basically been transformed in that part of the genome, because the, the imprint that they make is no longer mobile, right? It's only the daughter viruses that are mobile. The original imprint stays in the same place. So it turns out, good news, bad news, the last such invasion in the human genome occurred about 500,000 years ago. Uh, there are some large error bars associated with that, which means we do not have any evidence of an actively replicating endogenous virus in the human genome. Turns out that's actually pretty rare because all of our primate relatives have actively replicating endogenous viruses. So depending on which population of chimpanzee you uh, assay, you might actually get different imprints of uh, retroviruses that have actually separated one population from another population. So that's a lot of viruses, right? I just want to give you a sense of scale again so you can appreciate this. In the human genome, there are 100,000 integration events over the last 60 million years from 31 different classes of retroviruses that can be easily recognized as completely different retroviral lineages. Even if you assume that each of these 31 events happened once, that means 31 times a virus infected an organism, not only that, infected the sperm or egg producing cells of that organism, made an imprint and was then transmitted and went to fixation in that particular species. Each of these events I just described to you is extremely low probability, right? Infect an organism, low probability. Make an imprint in the uh, sperm or egg producing cell, another low probability. Go to fixation in the species, ex exceedingly low probability. And yet the fact that we see so many events just emphasizes this is a severe underestimate about the number of viruses that we've actually encountered just in the last 60 million years of evolution. For instance, the HIV virus has not left a single imprint in any human as far as we know. Do people know why that is? Good guess. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah, excellent, excellent guess. The, the, the guess was that if HIV kills the host, it may not be able to transmit. But actually, HIV doesn't kill the host that quickly. So there are opportunities, and in fact, we do have HIV-infected babies that are being born. There's actually a simpler reason. I'll give another opportunity uh, for a guess. Let's, let's, yeah, let's have only one person guess. Yeah, so excellent. So that's very, very close to the correct answer. It only infects hematopoietic cells, actually, right? So it's designed to actually infect CD4, CD8 uh, positive cells. It's not actually designed to infect the sperm or the egg. And because it never actually infects the sperm or the egg, it usually doesn't leave enough of an imprint to be passed on. Whereas all of these viruses, by definition, recognize receptors that are present on sperm or egg-producing cells, which is why they've been able to infect those cells in the first place and therefore leave an imprint. So that means there's a further sort of underestimate of the number of viruses that have affected us just because uh, most of them are not capable of leaving the imprint that we'd, lo we'd love to see in the genome. That's right. The fact that they don't leave an imprint doesn't mean that they don't cause deleterious effects. I'm only looking at it from the perspective of, in our his historical record, they've not left an imprint. So we cannot actually make any strong inferences about them because they're sort of part of this uh, missing uh, record. That's about, yeah. yeah there's a very basic question. So firstly, how do you recognize... Yeah, I'm going to get to that, yeah, the methodology. Yeah, so in the human genome, uh, I, I'm sorry if I didn't make that clear, there are, all of these uh, viruses yes. are present. In the human genome, there are no actively replicating copies. Oh, they are no, they're not. That's right. But in our relatives, there are actively replicating copies. And that is just a stochastic thing. It's not because we are just special. It just happens that there was a bottleneck event where these viruses just could not outrun mutation. And if you didn't replicate before mutation caught up with the last copy, you're basically dead in the genome. So it's an extinction event, except the dead fossil versions are still present in the genome. Uh, sir, uh, um, yeah. Sorry, um, among these primates, any any primate being a hotspot of getting invaded the most, or it has a large, uh, large quanta on its genome which has uh, which has got uh, m most of the invasions. Yeah, it's an excellent question. So it actually turns out it's not on my uh, record here, but gibbons have been particularly vulnerable to a lot of retroviral invasions. We don't know whether that's reflective of their biology or something else. This is actually an active area of investigation. So in gibbons, in certain populations, uh, so in the human genome, it's 8% of the human genome is made of dead viruses. In certain gibbon populations, it could be as high as 15% of the genome, right? So that's, we don't understand the nature of the uh, sort of events. People are uh, not convinced that these were retroviral invasions, but you could also imagine that if a chunk of the genome duplicated and happened to be carrying a lot of these things, that we would count them as double, but that doesn't mean that they've actually replicated to those uh, high numbers. Kostu? Are all retrotransposons derived from retroviruses? No. So these are only things that clearly derive from an active, infectious, exogenous virus. I'm not including other classes of mobile elements in here. However, 8% of the human genome is still an impressive amount when you consider that 3% of the human genome encodes all of the things that you need, RNA, protein, et cetera, to make you human. Everything that you need to build a human cell comes from about 3% of the genome. So it makes you wonder what the rest of the genome is. And so this is basically what the rest of the genome looks like. Uh, about 34% comes from these uh, completely different class of selfish DNA that Costa was referring to, which, which we call as retroelements or retrotransposons. These are selfish DNA that were not from an exogenous virus. They've just been re replicating and making copies of themselves in our genome. It's an awesome, actually, area of, uh, to lecture in, but that will take another hour lecture, so I'm not going to discuss that today. So uh, non-LTR simply is a classification uh, standing for long terminal repeats. Turns out that these endogenous retroviruses, which clearly derive from retroviruses, we can distinguish these two classes because they have long terminal repeats. So we know that this class here came from an exogenous virus, whereas this class here did not, right? 
Uh, there are also completely extinct varieties of a different class of mobile element called DNA transposons. There's a whole class I'm calling other. We have no idea what this is, but it is quite possible that this actually represents uh, exogenous viruses or endogenous viruses that have decayed so much that we can't even recognize them bioinformatically as having derived from an exogenous virus in the first place, right? So if this was your IT department, you would have totally fired them, right? Your, your genome is basically made up of viruses, my God, and the rest of it, good news, it's all spam. Basically, these are all sort of selfishly replicating elements which are really doing nothing except propagating themselves, perhaps at the, at the expense of host fitness. So it's really important to consider this sort of genomic perspective because a lot of sort of uh, people have the ability to sort of think about humanity at the ab absolute apex of the evolutionary sort of spectrum. Drosophila, which I also study in my lab, is far more efficient at getting rid of these mobile elements from its genome. So less than 5% of the entire Drosophila genome is made up of mobile elements. Here, an underestimate is about 50% of the human genome, right? So we are definitely not at the sort of absolute apex, at least when it comes to genomic housekeeping. Non-coding regions of the genome, as somebody else pointed out earlier, junk DNA, yeah. which didn't serve any quote-unquote useful purpose. But now, increasingly, every year, there are advances in understanding how we, you know, what role they play. Like yeah, perhaps, I perhaps. I will be, I'm still one of those agnostics that are basically uh, leaving with, unless you prove otherwise, I'm going to refer to this as junk DNA, and you are welcome to prove me wrong. And I think that should be the null hypothesis that a piece of DNA, by definition, unless you can ascribe some functional properties uh, or value to it, should be think, thought about as junk DNA. It's just the, it's what I'm trying to emphasize with this slide here is the scale of that junk DNA is far more profound than, than we had originally sort of recognized. Okay, so how do we do this? So again, remember, a retrovirus actually consists of three genes in particular. There's the gag gene. Think about this as the making up all the panels of the spaceship that enters, right? This is the capsid uh, that makes the outer coat of the retrovirus. This is all of the inner machinery, the so-called warp drive of the retrovirus, includes all of the enzymatic activities required by the virus. And this is, if you will, the shield of the virus that allows it to both infect cells, but also sort of allows it the infectious properties. And it is this imprint of an active virus that actually makes an imprint in the genome. But the longer it sits in the genome, it's going to be subject to the random process of mutation, which is a chemical process that allows this process to occur. So you're basically gonna have debilitating mutations that will be accumulated because there's no value to the genome to preserve this necessarily, right? So and the longer it sits in the genome, the more mutations it's going to accumulate. So using two types of metrics, which primates have the same imprint in the same location, and how much have they decayed in evolution, we can precisely date each of these 100,000 imprints, right? Now, this sounds a lot like accounting. I have to tell you, I apologize to the accountants in the audience. My parents really wanted me to do accounting at a very brief period. This was when I told them I was going to become an evolutionary biologist, and they said, my God, how will you make any money? Maybe you should do accounting on the side just so that you can actually uh, make some money. This is very much like accounting. You're basically doing an audit of all of these insertions of the genome, counting all the mutations, and basically coming up with a time estimate. And just like what I thought about accounting almost 20 years ago, this is fairly boring, right? Basically, you're just lining these up and you're looking for them. I should point out, though, these are recent enough that there's no ambiguity that these are derived from a, from a retrovirus. Much more difficult after these imprints have been there for more than 60 million years because they've accumulated a lot of mutation. However, once in a while, you discover something that totally surprises you, right? You have in this accounting exercise this completely dread imprint of a virus, which should be completely dead throughout its length, but it's not. One of these genes, the envelope gene in particular, has been completely protected from the random mutational process that you'd expect to occur in the genome. It's almost as if the genome has decided I like this part of the gene. I'm gonna use it for my own purpose, and that's why I'm gonna protect it from random mutation, just like it would protect any genes such as P53 or any of the genes that make up all of the housekeeping functions within the cell. So this is quite bizarre, 
because this is the last gene you would expect the genome to want to preserve because after all, it is the very gene that provides the infectious causing capacity of retroviruses. So why would the genome want to preserve the very gene that causes the infectious causing capacity of the retroviruses? So this is the fascinating question that a number of labs have been focusing attention on. Well, well, let me get the answer. But I'm not guessing because I just want to make sure that people who have to leave can get on, on the time. The first of these was called Syncytin. It was described by John McCoy's lab and also by Terry Heidman's lab. It has been preserved as an intact gene for nearly 35 million years of primate evolution. That means 35 million years ago, a retrovirus landed into the primate genome, and the rest of the gene, uh, genome of this virus has completely decayed, but the envelope gene has been preserved in all of these primates. Amazingly, despite 35 million years where it has no longer been a part of a retrovirus, if you put this gene back into a retrovirus backbone, it is still capable of acting as an envelope gene. So it has not biochemically lost the ability to act as an infectious causing gene just by virtue of the fact that it's been retained by primates. But the biggest clue is it is essentially abundantly expressed only in one tissue type, which is the placenta. So uh, the placenta is of course a very important tissue because this is actually the tissue that negotiates all of the interactions between the developing fetus and mom's womb. The placenta is a zygotic tissue. It's expressed from zygotic, which means a child's genome. And yet it is the one genome that is making the negotiations with mom to, to essentially get nutrients from mom through her bloodstream. And one cell type in this placenta is particularly interesting, which is these syncytiotrophoblasts, which are absolutely necessary for mom to be able to transmit nutrition from her bloodstream into the developing fetus. There's a second very important function that these trophoblasts do, which is to protect the fetus, which after all is an alien growing foreign body within mom, but that needs to be protected from the immune reaction from mom's immune system. So think about it. Two properties that are really important for this cell type, the ability to fuse cells really rapidly and the ability to protect from the immune system. By the way, the retroviral envelope gene is designed exactly for that purpose, right? So what that means is, bizarrely, 35 million years ago, primate genomes acquired the very gene from retroviruses that allowed it to do the very special properties of these cell types that don't exist in any other cell type that allow placental birth in primates to occur. This is bizarre, right? I mean, this is a fundamental aspect of our reproduction, and I just told you that the key step of this process relies on a retroviral invasion in primates, but after all, primates are not the only uh, mammalian cell type that do live birth. So let's consider other types. Let's consider rodents. Well, it turns out rodents have their own two syncytin genes that are derived from completely different classes of retroviruses. What about sheep and goats, other animals we care about, also have their own very spe special syncytin. Rabbits and hares, special syncytin. Cats and dogs, special syncytin. What's amazing is that at least seven different times in mammalian evolution, envelope genes have basically come in, become domesticated for placental function, and are now critical. Now, only in a couple of cases can we say this is causally required for placental birth, because you can actually do knockout experiments where you can kill the syncytin genes of mice and it turns out that they are no longer capable of carrying pregnancies to term because the fetus does not feed enough from mom to be able to transmit. So biologically, this is a very profound aspect of our own biology, reproductive biology, that at its heart actually depends on a gene that could only have actually come from a virus, and in this case from a retrovirus, because of the imprints that it left in the genome. Just a sec. There is one class of mammals that does not have a syncytin. Can anybody identify this mammal right here? <laughs> Excellent, you guys have been up. And the reason it doesn't have a syncytin gene is that because it doesn't do live birth at all. Because platypus are the only lineage of mammals with just like birds and reptiles lay eggs. They have all of the features of laying eggs. They still produce milk. They're still capable of weaning their offspring, but they are not capable of live birth unlike marsupials such as kangaroos and eutherians such as us. And what's kind of amazing is that 
in our own genome, just like these dead retrovirus genes, we can actually identify no longer active genes associated with production of egg proteins. So our own ancestry of being primarily an egg producing lineage that became a placental lineage has also left an imprint in the genome. This is not just conjecture. We can actually identify the remnants of these egg producing genes in our own genome. These genes of course are intact in the platypus and birds. They're now decrepit in us because they've not been used for about 150 million years. So this is just to emphasize that this is something quite profound that occurred in our biology. We went from an egg-laying sort of ancestry to a, a, to a reproductive biology that involved placental birth. And yet the fundamental feature of this, and I'm only talking about one feature here, the actual engineering that is done for this placental birth to occur actually came from a, a retroviral envelope gene. So hopefully this is sort of open your eyes to the fact that we don't think about these viruses just as these pathological entities. They've actually contributed significant chunks to our biology. They've also contributed in work that I'm not going to describe, aspects of our own immune system actually comes from these dead viruses, which is a bit too complicated to describe in an open lecture, but we are very actively studying that in the laboratory. I just want to make this last point that we used to think that mammals are the only vertebrate lineage that do placental birth. Until very recently, it was discovered that this species of lizards, have you, any of you heard about these lizards? These are called Mabuya lizards. They're, they're also referred to as the super freaks of evolution because they actually have a human-like placenta. Very, very unusual among lizards, right? What's even more bizarre is if you look in their genome, unlike other lizards, they have a domesticated syncytin gene. So this is almost like the best proof you could actually ask for to make a causal connection. Not only do you have seven instances of primate syncytins that do placental function, you have this completely independent origin of placental function in a completely different vertebrate, and that was also associated with domestication of a retroviral envelope gene, right? So again, fundamental aspects of our biology, what I would refer to as the gifts of these uh, ancient viruses. Would it be accurate to say that placental birth only, only evolved in humans after the retrovirus? No. So uh, it's very clear that the syncytin gene came after placental birth already existed, but it probably replaced a pre-existing placental syncytin gene that was also. So we've been trading up just like you would trade up for a new car. You're basically, this is just the version that has been kept, but there's probably a previously uh, acting version which we cannot this, distinguish. This ensured that there were higher chances of the fetus eventually becoming, uh, you know. Yeah, in a, in a way, this is like uh, trading up for a better housekeeping function. Uh, and retroviral invasions provided you the ability to sample these functions. So I'll briefly sort of to point to another aspect which these envelope genes have been preserved for, which we know of. Uh, so retroviruses, as I said, they have to negotiate interactions with a receptor on the cell surface in order to gain entry into cells. With HIV, this would be a CD4 receptor. If you're knocked out for CD4 or CCR5, you actually are pretty impervious to these uh, retroviral infections. Turns out that's a great engineering principle because some of these endogenous uh, retroviruses still encode envelope genes, and their only function is to act as decoys to take away the receptor and no longer make it available to retroviral invasions, right? So these envelope genes are now acting as a host defense mechanism by basically doing receptor blockade, effectively preventing the receptor from being available uh, in this. And again, remarkably, this has occurred three separate times in evolution. We are actively studying one candidate case in humans, but at least in three cases, this has been studied and demonstrated in mice, in chickens, and in sheep. So, Amazing sort of way of uh, evolution to use opportunistically all of the resources at its disposal. The sort of important sort of point I want to emphasize is this is just the tip of the iceberg. There are 18 instances of human genes. We know of the function of only two of them. There are greater than 30 domesticated gag genes. We know of the function of none of them, right? So there's a lot of discovery waiting to be discovered. All of these imprints were made in the last 60 million years of evolution. Um, and these are just the retroviruses. Uh, it's important to consider how much of our biology is shaped by these stolen genes. These are genes we stole from a virus because it happened to land in our genome. Other viruses do not have an obligate step in their life cycle 
to leave an imprint in the host genome. Nonetheless, accidentally, they have left imprints as well. Uh, so for instance, here are our own genomes and a rogues gallery of viruses we really care about. Borna viruses, that can cause schizophrenia or it's suspected. Filoviruses, can you give me an example of a filovirus? Ebola is a filovirus, Marburg virus is a filovirus, right? Really, really deadly viruses. And yet, 25 million years ago, our ancestors not only encountered an Ebola, something very similar to Ebola, it's part of our genome. It's actually being passaged on. Uh, so we have other classes like circoviruses and parvoviruses. And just like what I talked to you about the receptor blockade, uh, fruit bats have an endogenous copy of the Ebola gene called VP35 that dates back 100 million years, right? 100 million years of fruit bats have all preserved this particular gene at the same location in their genome. That tells us two things. Ebola is really old, at least 100 million years at the lower estimate. And secondly, the fact that these fruit bats have preserved the Ebola gene may be very important to understand how come fruit bats, which are the reservoir for Ebola, are not actually being killed by Ebola, whereas gorillas and people who get infected by Ebola are getting killed. And so these domesticated genes are not just an evolutionary novelty. They provide really excellent insight into what we might be considering as the next therapeutic in order to go after viruses such as Ebola. Uh, we don't know how they're using it. This is actually an active area of uh, research. They're using it either as a decoy or uh, what we refer to as a dominant negative. They fool the Ebola envelope to interacting with this protein. Okay, I just want to remind you, this is a vast underestimate of viral infections because each of these events, infection and passaging, is a low probability event. So all of these are just an underestimate of the amount of viral invasion that has occurred. In the last few minutes, I'll just tell you a little bit about another approach that my lab has sort of pioneered in order to get an insight into these ancient viruses that have not left an imprint in the genome. And these are viruses, we don't actually know what they are because they didn't leave an imprint, we have no idea what they are, but we can infer that they existed based on host genetics. The idea is, if ancient viruses influence the evolution of host antiviral genes, we can potentially detect the impact they had on these host genes as they occurred in evolution and try to understand if there's any modern consequences. And I'll just give you one vignette where this has become possible. So this is, in fact, the evolutionary arms race that we all study uh, implicitly in when we think about immunity. You have an immune surveillance gene. It's recognizing some sort of viral population. Because of this, it's successful. The virus will, be ex uh, will go extinct because the host gene is so functional. This puts Darwinian pressure on the viral population to evolve a new strategy. Now, this particular version is not susceptible. All of its cousins are. And so that version will quickly sweep through fixation. Now you have a viral population that is essentially immune to the interaction of this gene, forcing this gene to evolve to keep pace with the virus. Now, the important point is that we have no idea what this looks like, right? Because these viruses have not, you know, left like an actuarial record of their existence. But we have a very good record of what this looked like and how these immune genes have changed in evolution. And so by using the viral evolution as an evolutionary echo of what it left in the human sort of immune gene, we are basically inferring the action of these viruses. So one gene that I'll tell you about, this is a slightly older study but makes the point well, is called TRIM5-alpha. TRIM5-alpha is a really important gene when it comes to uh, HIV because TRIM5-alpha is the single most important reason why rhesus macaques cannot get infected with HIV. Uh, and the way it works in rhesus macaques is that this gene, which is expressed in the cytoplasm, encounters the retroviral capsid upon entry rapidly recognizes it and degrades it before it has a chance to complete its life cycle. This entire game is being won or lost by the speed of interaction of TRIM5-alpha with the capsid. Turns out, human TRIM5-alpha also exists, can also interact with the capsid, but it does so with such low specificity or kinetics that it cannot actually uh, block the virus in a meaningful, uh, biologically meaningful way. So question is, what does human TRIM5-alpha do? That, what is it good against? Uh, among all the things that we surveyed, the one gene that came up repeatedly, uh, one virus that came up repeatedly is MLV. Does anybody know what MLV is, stands for? 
Oh, excellent. Murine leukemia virus, uh, to be more precise. So of all the things that we have encountered, murine leukemia virus, something that came from a mouse, is the one the human genome adapted. We would love for it to be good against these human-specific viruses, but it's not. Made us ponder, are there relatives of murine leukemia virus that could actually explain why human trim 5 alpha became like it? And that led us to a class of retroviruses called PTERVs for pantroglodytes ERVs, or pantroglodytes endogenous retroviruses. It turns out, four million years ago, there was an invasion of the gorilla and the chimpanzee genomes exactly at the same time. And this has led to about 100 copies of this PTERV in both the chimp and the gorilla genomes. Estimates vary between 80 to 100 copies. No active copies now, it's gone extinct. But no copies at all in the human genome. This is at a time where we've actually exchanged other viruses, so we became very interested in why not humans, and was this in fact a genetic protection, leading to this bizarre hypothesis, is it possible that human trim 5, which we can detect is really good against murine leukemia virus, may have been really good against PTERV, because PTERV is actually the closest relative of murine leukemia virus, right? It just happens to be infecting chimpanzees. So let's test it. Here's a problem. I just told you that PTERV went extinct four million years ago, right? So to be able to do this test, we'd have to bring this virus back to life. Uh, at this point, most normal people have said, yeah, we can't do that, let's move on. But we are not normal people. So we went back into the genomes of the chimp and gorilla uh, sort of genomes, and we said, well, there's a lot of dead viruses here, but based on them, we can exactly reconstruct mathematically what the ancestor of all of these dead viruses must have looked like. And the reason we can do that, as I told you, this provirus is uh, degrading away, but it's because of random mutation. So if you look at 100 different copies, they all have actually slightly different mutations because they all suffered different mutations. And based on that, we can create an ancestral consensus that is actually the progenitor of all of these dead viruses. And in theory, this should work. Now, this is the beginning of a really bad science fiction novel. This is pretty much how all bad science fiction novels start, right? So I want to be very careful here. We are not in the business of resurrecting viruses that may or may not have driven species to extinction, particularly our own. But we can now just resurrect one gene of this virus, which is the capsid gene, because we know that that's the target of trim 5 alpha And we can put it into a virus that is incapable of transmitting its own genome, but only transmits GFP. So essentially use this capsid as a readout of infectivity without any possibility at all that the virus can escape. Now, some of our colleagues are much braver uh, they're usually the scientists you see in these science fiction movies. They've actually resurrected this virus. Everything I'm telling you is true of the virus, but we were just not brave slash foolhardy enough to create the full intact virus. So what we did was instead put this virus in the MLV backbone. Again, these do not carry any viral information. They only carry GFP, which is the marker for infectivity. So here's a, one of these random dead copies. Uh, which basically simply looks like there's no infectivity because if there was any GFP in the recipient cells, it would show up here. If we simply correct all of the obvious mutations in this, stop codons or any frame shifts, et cetera, for those of you who do biology, again, really nothing, it's crickets. And so here's the sort of really important thing where if we resurrect the, what we thought was the ancestor, we basically get robust 4% infectivity of this particular capsid. Now, 4% is not profound, but keep in mind, this is a Frankenstein virus. We've not put it in its own backbone. It would probably get better, but it was good enough for us to say that we can now test whether this ancestral, now extinct virus, was there any effect of TRIM5-alpha at all? In previous work, we had already demonstrated that the reason rhesus is really good against HIV is because it has a change in this recognition capsid at this position, where human has an arginine and rhesus has a different protein, uh, amino acid here, which gives it infectivity. So we focused on this patch instead, and what we found really sort of shocked us. Turns out, so here's no trim 5 alpha in these cells. We can see this is our negative control, 100% infectivity. Presence of and the current day version of human trim 5 alpha, 54 protection against this ancient virus. But the ancestor, which existed in humans, chimps, and gorillas, is not at all effective, which means that the single amino acid change that occurred here was associated with the massive gain of protection against this ancient virus. 
And this very change also led to a gain of susceptibility to the HIV virus, which took it from being biological to being biologically meaningless, basically, uh, in the terms of this infectivity. So very rarely have been able to be so precise with our estimates, and that's because so much has been known about HIV. But what that means is that our ancestors, just like chimps and gorillas, encountered PTOB, and we came up with an adaptation of a key immunity gene, trim 5 alpha that protected us from this. And now we can basically, we are all protected against PTOB, hooray for us, but that single change also actually meant that we were 50% more susceptible to HIV by virtue of that very change. And so these fitness trade-offs that have occurred in evolution are really important because they actually determine our current day susceptibility to viruses. So our immune repertoire is not a static entity. It's a, it's a book that's being written by every pathogen that we encounter as a species, and it's constantly being tuned to different specificities. And this is a really a elegant example, I think, of that. Yeah. Was there an earlier HIV infection which, uh, for which that was the... Uh, so actually in this case, we think the uh, earlier infectivity was not HIV at all. So trim 5 alpha works against a number of retroviruses. In this case, we think that the compromise it took was to actually uh, inf uh, gain better protection against this other virus. We have no idea what kind of impact this virus would have caused in terms of fitness consequences. And so this would have made a lot of sense at the time, right? when they'd encountered this virus to defeat this virus. Whether there was another HIV that, that, uh, that have led to this uh, earlier, we have no idea because we don't know what those viruses look like. They didn't leave enough of an imprint. So this is the present day version of the HIV, which is the only version that we can test. So there are in fact now in lemur some HIV-like proviruses, but those are more than 40 million years separated. And so the relevant time frame that we are testing this, we want something that was a contemporaneous virus. This change occurred exactly at the same time as this virus was encountered, which is why we think that this is probably the virus that drove this change. But that's the best we can do in this business uh, in terms of doing a contemporaneous co-evolution between the virus and the host. But is it possible, so you said that there's only 13% infectivity with this ancestral... Yes, uh, rhesus is about 4%. So there's additional changes in rhesus that further deplete that. But this key, the residue is actually a really important key. If you were to mutate this to an R gene in rhesus, rhesus loses all of its protective effect against uh, uh, HIV as well. So my question was, can, can one engineer... Ah, sorry. I mean? Yeah, so people are doing that right now, actually motivated by uh, a number of studies, including ours, where they're doing stem cell therapy in patients which have come up with stacked restriction factors like TRIM5-alpha. So what these are, because you can actually, you know, the, the hematopoietic system is already depleted in HIV patients, so it's easy to do stem cell therapy. You don't even have to do radiation. And these cells which are introduced are now completely resistant to HIV. So there are, in fact, trials underway. And there are two things that have happened. These cells have been engineered so that they are not carrying the receptor for HIV, CCR5, which we already know exists in people, and they're fine. So we know it's safe. And they're carrying single mutations in TRIM5 and another gene that I'm not talking about called APOBEC, which makes it highly, highly resistant against HIV. So a subset of the cells have been engineered, and hopefully these will now proliferate in people and be completely resistant to HIV. I'm a little bit skeptical because you're, the virus has actually grown up to high frequency in the, uh, in the body. So I suspect that there are variants that arise that could be escape variants, but it's a worthwhile thing to do this experiment. Um, and these pa patients could actually be uh, dramatically you know, prolonged in terms of their uh, lifespan. Okay, I just want to uh, end by uh, acknowledging uh, my very close colleague, Mike Emmerman. Uh, I hope it was not totally obvious, but I'm not a virologist. Uh, I'm an evolutionary biologist, that's my uh, motivation. And I had not even considered doing virology until I started my lab. And within months of starting my lab, I hit up a collaboration with Mike, who was an HIV virologist and was perplexed by all of these signatures of rapid evolution. And we joined forces, and it's been about 14 years uh, of an amazing collaboration. So I'm, be, I'm happy to take any more questions if there are any. Thanks. Yeah, it's a very exciting talk, very informative. Uh, I'm curious, so I, I'm a beginner in cancer genomics, and I, we, from the abstract, you work in a cancer research center. So what, what all do uh, viruses have, uh, what implications does it have for cancer research? 
I'm almost worried that you're on the board of our uh, institution because I have to make up something very clever every time I'm asked this question. Um, so certainly, certainly there's a lot of evolution that occurs in cancer. And certainly um, it's really worthwhile to like, because it's a really, a really great example of how essentially a parasitic cell or a cell lineage is adapted and all the changes that have occurred to that. Uh, we are only doing a little bit of computational work with that. I must say that, uh, yeah, uh, we are, if I, were to, uh, if I were to say that everything that I do is motivated by uh, application to human biology or uh, disease eradication, that would not be true. I, I would love for the work that we do in the case of term 5 alpha, it ha clearly has a therapeutic value, but we are not the people doing that stage of the work. Um, I think there's a nice synthesis between the basic sciences that we do and a lot of clinical colleagues who are sort of taking up this work. We have done some cancer genomics analysis for them with the same mindset. So for instance, looking at RAS mutations in pancreatic cancer, et cetera. Um, I wouldn't say that we've seen anything really profound in that. Um, in a totally different line of work, which I don't talk about, which is similar to what cost of study, we are very interested in how chromosome segregation defects occur in ca cancer, and that's much more relevant to the mission of the center that I work in. This is much more of, I think, my own sort of uh, interest in paleovirology and Mike's interest in HIV biology, and that's sort of our synthesis. Oh, excuse me. Sir. There's a number of questions. Maybe we come back to that from somebody's. Yeah, go ahead. Well, this question is regarding the syncytin gene. Uh, as, you've, as you've said, 35 million years ago, the, the gene was uh, pretty much getting inherited and conserved. Uh, but we had to compare in terms of marsupials that were divided 65 million years ago. How yeah. would you explain? Yeah, marsupials are actually older than that. That was about, uh, that separation is about 130 million years. Um, so this is not published work, so I want to be very careful here, and it's not our work. But there is a syncytin gene in marsupials, uh, and it's being, it's, the, the, the paper is being written up now. So all of these genes have, we, we're not convinced that these were the progenitor genes, syncytins, but what, what ends up happening, and we have evidence for that in the primates, is that there was a, uh, this was a question that was asked before, there was a primordial syncytin gene, which has now been replaced on seven different occasions by other newer versions of syncytin genes that were coming from active retroviruses. So the version we see in primates is 35 million years ago, but almost certainly it replaced a version that predated that. And when the new version came up, the previous version, basically there was no selection to keep it around in the population, and it has basically decayed. So what we have is actually not just one event. We think there was one event at the base of the marsupial Euterian lineage, and there have been subsequent replacements uh, over the course of mammalian evolution. Does that make sense? Uh, so basically, the, con the gene that has to be conserved has eventually got certain changes, and some of them are preserved now while well, they've deviated. To uh, maybe maybe an alteration of that. The gene that was originally required for placental birth probably no longer exists in any mammal. It's actually been replaced by genes that do very similar things that were derived from completely different lineages of retroviruses, but they're performing exactly the same function or better function, yeah. So Sir? A yeah. uh, couple of uh, quick points. This 8% uh, retroviral genome, is it uh, how final is final? There must be... Well, there's a 50% there's a that's other. Yeah, from So there, almost certainly yeah. the 8% of that is probably retroviruses, yeah, if you were to uh, estimate. Okay. Now, the, then when this retrovirus originally infected, uh, the genome would have been active. There must be a big role for the uh, silencing aspects of the genome, which would have made it to uh, in, in part of the, this conflict, right? Is yes. there anything uh, we understand about that? Yes, How so the, I, think, I think maybe just to repeat the question, yeah. uh, upon retroviral infection in the genome, how did the genome adapt to that? Yeah. Almost certainly there is a silencing of these imprints that occurs very, very rapidly. It occurs within just a couple of generations, we can see. And the primary imprint that is put on is DNA methylation. Yeah. And so DNA methylation is a really great way to silence all of these foreign invasions in the genome. It's recognized as foreign and, and invaded. And there are these uh, crab zinc finger proteins that are basically dedicated machinery. It's like the adaptive immune system to recognize foreign invaders. But some escape this. And in the germline, those imprints, the methylation is actually erased, which is why the germline is a great system 
uh, a great place for these pathogens to replicate because that imprint that's keeping them yeah. silent in somatic cells is gone. Yeah. So then the, the envelope gene, which is totally functional to adapt, I mean, to get useful to the host, could there have other functions other than just, uh, a, in a way, avoiding some other viruses getting in, uh, non-retroviral, uh, and uh, some kind of a crosstalk so that you, you, it become a selfish entity for the host now and not allowing some other systems to come in. Yeah, I just want to clarify. You're referring to the genes that have been protected from mutation, apparently, and have been preserved. For those, we think that there are uh, important functions. Uh, it's impo it's, we can actually distinguish between whether they're involved in immunity versus some housekeeping function like syncytin is based on the rate of evolution of those genes. And for many of those genes, we do signa see signatures consistent with some sort of protective role, and for others, we do not. So I think, I think there's a more biology to be discovered, but clearly, those are all genes which have some sort of host function now. There's no, no other explanation for how they would have been kept intact and pristine for so many years of random mutation. Otherwise, they would have been lost by and chance. Something about the gag you said? There's uh, something uh, about gag? Would you like to say? Uh, something about the gag. Yeah. I think it's super interesting. Gag is a, a complex thing, though, because it has both capsid-forming ability, but also has this nuclear matrix protein. And in some cases, we know that it's the matrix that's preserved, but the capsid is gone. Um, I think it's a really great epitope generator. I think epitope generation might be a very important function for GAG, so just to prime the immune system uh, to do its job. But I don't know. Uh, sir? Yes. Yeah, uh, my friend, he just asked about how the syncytion gene might have evolved over time in, uh, I mean, initially in mammals and then later on in marsupials. Uh, was this sort of because the initially the syncytion gene might not have been as effective and because of uh, retroviral insertions, uh, natural selection favored it and eventually... There's an active debate about that. So here's the problem. There are two hypotheses, right? Let's say there was a, a syncytin that occurred earlier. It was replaced by another syncytin. Let's call it syncytin 2. Hypothesis 1 is syncytin 2 is better than syncytin 1. Hypothesis 2 is they were the same. Now, if they were the same, there's a 50% chance that the original guy would be preserved and a 50% chance that the second guy would be preserved. Yeah. If the first guy was preserved, the sec this guy would be lost, mm. and we would just consider it as the ancestral one. If the second guy was preserved, we would say, oh, wow, it was a replacement. Mm. So this does not have to be because it was actually better. It just happened to be able to, be able to do the job, and that relaxed the selection on keeping two copies. Because of this sort of inference, we don't want to fall into a trap of saying that the Syncytin 2 was better. I think it was just when it, uh, it allowed the environment to essentially decay the original gene, and that is the only signal which we can actually ascertain. Okay, and my main question is, two or three years ago, or I mean even this year also, they said because of global warming, um, I, you know, the ice caps are melting, and because of that, ancient pathogens which we may not have experienced for 200, 300,000 years, or even millions of years, are coming into the fore now. Could study of, uh, I mean, what we call junk DNA right now that has, you know, bits and pieces of ancient viruses, could this be used to uh, provide immunity against uh, the, this uh, epidemic or so that might occur sometime in the future? I just want to clarify, this is not related to your previous question. Or, or this no, it's not, not okay. related to my previous no, question. No, the, the question is quite valid. I think the way I would think about it is, I think the present day sort of exposure to new pathogens it's not even so much global warming. It's just the fact that we are going into eco ecosystems where we've not been before. And we are encountering and we are actually displacing host organisms. Bats are a really great example, right? I mean, if you look With at what's happening. the polar virus again, yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and there are actually bat populations, entire bat and macaque populations in eastern India that are being, de you know, completely yeah. displaced by deforestation. We don't have to be so elaborate, right? Rhesus macaques. 40% of rhesus macaques in Asia carry a herpes called herpes B virus. If you're a human being who gets infected by herpes B, you have 48 hours to live, right? Okay. Rhesus macaques are not killed by herpes B. So zoonosis essentially provides a massive kind of uh, opportunity for a virus to encounter an immune system that has had no chance to adapt to it. And this is why these pathogens are really uh, significant. I think global warming, et cetera, uh, are, are, are great 
But I think we are doing, we don't even have to go that far. I mean, this obviously all ties in with global warming. We're doing it enough. simply has to do with the fact that human uh, expansion. expansion has now allowed us to expose. I mean, bushmeat hunting is the primary source of HIV most, uh, most uh, of the viruses. But it's an important food source, right? So you cannot be judgmental in, in India where, you know, we, like 60% of India is vegetarian, but you know that's not like an option in many uh, villages in Africa. So I think, I think it's not so much that it's going to stop practices, but I think we just have to be much more vigilant. And there's a lot of people who are being vigilant by basically assaying uh, bushmeat uh, to see what are the pathogens that could be exposed and, and, and you know, what are the types of pathogens that are on the cusp of becoming, if you will, uh, the next sort of human epidemic. Yes. Good evening, sir. I'm a physician, so whenever I give lectures on HIV, I take them back to the Mahabharat, which has a, an ocean of stories, especially when I talk about immunology. Kurukshetra is taken as one of the allegories of uh, immune systems, which happens inside, has happened outside also. You were just telling uh, that HIV virus, it negotiates with the, the receptor, CD4. I consider that as the Shakuni Kutantra was to negotiate with CD4, like the simile is uh, Duryodhana. And he entered Kuru, Kuru uh, that is Kauravas team, and they were not able to identify that he was thinking of ending their life. So he was actually enemy disguised, but negotiated positively, he entered the, the Palya, and he, he wanted to bring an end to them. Although he did not replicate that the HIV, like the HIV did, but he did cut short all the immune mechanisms that cover was had, so that he could ultimately perish cause perish or uh, destroy the cover of us. So this is one area where I can uh, give a simile whether, where the students can easily understand that how it negotiates and not, ident uh, not able to be identified by the human immune system. It masquerades itself uh, as a friend, as a family person. He enters and starts replicating and plans to destroy cover of us. The message is that there are many concepts in our uh, scriptures which scientists like you can figure out how Kutantras, Tantras and Kutantras made by Krishna or Shakuni or many other things can ultimately lead to an answer for our biology. It's not a question. I think I'm I just think sharing what he was telling, just to make the atmosphere a little ease out. Okay. So Indians are experts in telling everything that is there, newly discovered, is already there in our scriptures. But this concept, uh, I was interested in uh, uh, telling you, because that if you explore so many things, so many concepts in our uh, Kurukshetra itself, immune system, you can uh, really uh, do a lot of research on that. Thank you. The yeah. extension of the question asked earlier that the envelope portion was conserved and it was kept. So is it possible, sir, that the body itself is maintaining a pool of antibodies by processing those genes present there to the, through MHCs so that if there is an, another insult on the body, like secondary response, we can mount and it is like out of uh, protection that the body is taking. That's why it's saving the envelope portion. Yeah, that's an excellent question. I think that was my... That was my um, much less nicely put response to Dr. Nagaraja's question, which is, we don't think that that's true for the envelope just because of its, you know, you need to be expressed in the thymus in order to educate the, the immune system. But a lot of these gag genes that are preserved are expressed there. And so whether they're being used to prime the immune system to in order to develop it, that's certainly a completely possible. And that would be enough to preserve these genes. So it's an excellent suggestion. I will point out that in sheep, which are exposed to yakti sheep retroviruses, that is exactly what's going on. So sheep that have encountered yakti sheep and have made it a part of their genomes, 
actually develop antibodies against that. You know, the risk is, of course, you can develop autoimmunity, but if you're facing a raging pathogenic infection of JSRV-like viruses, you're the only sheep in the herd that, are, that is basically protected from the otherwise lethal effects of this virus. So there is always this trade-off between autoimmunity, right? So you could actually become something where you recognize your own cells as foreign, and actual immunity. And the genome is always at this teeter-totter between those two steps. But certainly preservation for cross-presentation of epitopes is a very a legitimate uh, possibility for this. So it's an excellent suggestion. And sir, one more part, sir. Yeah. One more part. No, no, wait, the, but you'll have enough opportunity to ask all, all your questions, yeah. Uh, so you mentioned that uh, the R2Q mutation in the trim file is actually... Sorry, I didn't hear the first part of your question. Yeah. You mentioned that the R2Q mutation in the trim 5 is actually beneficial for humans. So why we have not evolved with that particular mutation? Is it because of the, uh, the recent evasion of HIV on the evolutionary time scale or there is... It, it's, there, you know, those are the, why, why we haven't seen something is always like great because I, there's no wrong answer. But unfortunately, there's no right answer either. So there are two reasons. Yes, you could argue that HIV uh, is recent, but actually there are parts of the world where HIV is a huge fitness consequence, right? I mean, in, in parts of South Africa, the life expectancy for young males is like 27, right? Because of HIV. And so that's not, that's a huge thing. So if there was something happening, but it's, you just have to also have access to the mutations, right? So even though we have 7 billion humans, the fact is that we believe that we all went through a population bottleneck 10,000 years ago. So the genetic diversity that needs to rebuild up in a population in order for you to basically be able to act upon, we are just at a disadvantage, even compared to something like chimp, which actually has, there's far fewer chimp in the world than there are human beings, but genetic diversity-wise, they're actually far better off than human beings are until recently. I mean, that, that's a, obviously, we are not doing a good job of being hospitable to our evolutionary relatives, so. Uh, so please, uh, uh, you talked about uh, integration of uh, uh, retroviruses into human genome. Please, I want to know if uh, uh, non-retroviruses also have uh, a mechanism to create an imprint into a human yeah, genome. Yeah, so I didn't actually that talk about, okay. yeah, the, absolutely. Uh, in fact, uh, non-retroviruses do have the ability to uh, integrate in the genome, uh, but this is not because of uh, an, a step in the life cycle. This is actually believed to be an accident where the line one retrotransposition machinery hopped onto an RNA associated with these viruses and basically integrated them in the genome. So these viruses were clearly present at a time when the uh, germline events were happening, but this is not a step in the life cycle of the virus. This was just that the RNA was available. The machinery for depositing these pseudogenes hopped onto that RNA and integrated that. It's great for us because now that provides us a sampling that that virus was actually present in the common ancestor of these primates. But it's a very, very spotty record because we cannot rely on this record because it was just a very, you know, very accidental in the way that it occurred. So, well, give, if I have a, a human genome or any genome from any mammal, what computational tools or how can I infer? An oh, how can you infer that? Yeah. Okay, so there's actually some, uh, you can start with a very simple tool, which is BLAST. Right, which where we basically start with the consensus sequences of about 80 different classes of retroviruses and start with that. But you can do the same thing and extend to other classes of viruses. So for instance, this Borna viral discovery was made when people were actually looking for other primate versions of Borna viruses. Uh, and they discovered that actually there were some versions of the Borna virus that were un lying undetected in the human genome itself. Then when you see that, you have to do a lot of work to show that's a bona fide integration event and not just contamination. But, that can all, but, but these are all viruses that can be identified by the simplest tools possible. Right? You could use the tools of BLAST and Microsoft Word and you can actually identify all of these viruses. It gets much more complex once you go past a certain time threshold, then you have to use more sophisticated uh, hidden Markov models in order to be able to go deeper into these. But these viruses that I'm telling you about today are all easily identified just by blast searches. Okay. Uh, sir, one more question, please. Let, let's come back to another question, but I will come back to that. Yeah. Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, so this is regarding the syntactic gene. So uh, is it possible that this gene did not have a mammalian origin at all and some ancient organism was infected by some ancient retrovirus which gave the, imparted the organism with the ability to form a placenta and the whole mammalian thing took off from there? Is it, is it uh, conceivable that way? Uh, you know, Occam would be like, like ro revolving in his grave for you to say that because you're invoking mechanisms additional to what we have without actually eliminating any of the mechanisms. So what, what do we know? We know that retroviruses invade genomes. We know that they're capable of imparting their imprints in the germ line. And we know that that imprint, which we can see because of the rest of the retrovirus exists, right? So the syncytin gene that is expressed is ex expressed from within the skeleton of what was previously a retrovirus. So we don't have to invoke a second event to occur. We can invoke the minimum number of steps needed to, to say that, okay, a retrovirus came in, it decayed except the envelope gene, and then the envelope gene is basically the syncytin gene. So syncytin is the name that's given to that gene, but once it was recognized that it was part of a retrovirus, it was basically just called syncytin on. Does that make sense? So if the syncytin gene existed, but the neighborhood of that gene was like completely non-retroviral, your uh, hypothesis could be considered, but because it actually exists in the husk of this dead retrovirus, we, we don't have to invoke anything else. Um, I am curious about uh, this fact that we learned that uh, species are learning from the retrovirus certain functions and they're adapting and keeping it within itself. But what is, uh, I'm not uh, able to understand is that uh, if a retrovirus was not supposed to have a function relevant to placenta or to for egg shell protein re relevant, then how does that function uh, reflect on this in the species? So, uh, well, what you're saying is, so what I would simply argue is placental birth is not inevitable. Yeah. Right? In fact, it's quite rare in the animal kingdom. And if, if we had not encountered just the right sequence of events, you know, maternity wards would have like a totally different outcome in, in, in human beings. So there's just a lot of these sort of events that have occurred in evolution, which in hindsight are like critical absolute events. But at the time that they occurred were just like choices being made between two lifestyles, egg laying versus placental. So I would not ascribe much more, you know, Except once it got entrenched, two things happened. The placental birth took off, the egg laying genes went decrepit, and now it was irreversible. You couldn't go back. But there was a brief period where you had both genes and you, a choice was made in terms of which one. But, but the retrovirus gene was probably not uh, related for placental birth. Is, am I getting that wrong? No, the retrovirus has not, no business. It doesn't care whether it's being used for a, Its envelope gene has the functional properties it needs to be infectious and to protect itself exactly. from the immune system. It just happens that those are two really good properties for placental birth in, in hindsight. And th those, those are the reasons that okay. they became really good at uh, Thanks being a lot. That hijacked. explains. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you told the marsupians they are resistant. I mean, they have a kind of resistance to Ebola because they have their Ebola gene, retrovirus gene in them. So You're talking about microbats now. No, no. Uh, sorry, yeah, microbats, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Fruit bats. Yeah. Uh, so I just want to point out that's a hypothesis, right? We don't know whether that's true, true. but that's what's being hypothesized. Uh, is there any evidence like in humans, like we have certain retroviral genes in ours. So are they giving us any resistance to any of the viruses? Yeah, so this was the question that Prof. Raghurajan and, and somebody else also asked. We suspect so, yes, but we have not demonstrated that. We are actively working on one gene, which we think is really important for priming the immune system. Uh, upon interferon sort of induction. Uh, we haven't demonstrated that, so at this point it remains a hypothesis that uh, in fact they're being used for host defense. But as I said, there's a lot to do. There's about 30 genes that still remain to be fully described functionally. Um, I would be shocked beyond words if about half of them don't turn out to be host defense genes. Um, yeah, but uh, I've been spectacularly wrong before, so, you know, <laughs> if I come back in 15 years and you can tell me you were completely wrong. But the, but the good news is you'll forget this conversation by that time. So. Uh, one more thing, and uh, about the insight in gene, uh, can we hypothesize that the, our genome itself the, uh, thought that the synthesis uh, gene from the virus is better and try to keep it, like, or some yeah, so I mean, I don't want to be anthropomorphic here, right? Even though we are talking about the human genome. 
this is just the random process of mutation and you know Darwinism. You can imagine that uh, two hum two primates, both of them have the syncytin gene, right? And one of them lost the syncytin gene. This one preserved it. This one was less efficient at placental birth, and that would be sufficient to keep the syncytin gene during every generation, so that even after 35 million years, you've preserved it. It's not about like an active choice. It just happens to be, these are all the activities that are present. For instance, if the retroviral envelope gene could not be expressed at all as RNA or protein, there would never have been selection because the human uh, genome or the primate genome would never have had the ability to sample that particular activity in the genome. So it, it landed, it expressed, it, it provided some sort of placental function, and it was basically preserved. Um, you've mentioned that the syncytin gene is present in seven different mammalian groups based yes. on various retroviral infection events. How likely is it that these genes are functionally interchangeable? If I were to take one of them from a cat or a dog and insert it into a rodent, how likely is it that that particular fetus would still be carried to term? It's, a, it's an excellent question. Uh, I don't know if anybody is actively doing that. Uh, that, is a, that is a totally testable hypothesis in mouse because mouse, we have been able to knock out the two syncytin genes that do exist in mice. Now, I should point out that syncytin is also involved in uh, mediating uh, receptor interactions, right? So, so it has to be that the gene that we provide as a replacement needs to bind a receptor that is present and conserved in the mouse genome. That's not impossible, but we have to kind of worry about that. So perhaps a much more easy question, perhaps even more radical would be, what if we replace it with another mouse retroviral envelope? There we already know it's capable of mediating receptor interactions on the, on the germline surface. So can we take something that is an active retroviral envelope gene today, but is capable of infecting mice, and can that be used as a replacement of syncytin? That, I think, would be far more likely to succeed than a completely different syncytin, because the receptor interactions might be quite different between the species. Hi. Uh, so I was uh, wondering about uh, the one where you were trying to reconstruct a, a, a retroviral gene mm -hmm. based on the mutations that you see right now. So what I'm, what I'm not understanding, or maybe I didn't get it properly from what you were saying, is uh, you have the access to the mutation, but you don't have access to the ground truth, right? So how do you uh, know... Don't have access to the... Ground truth. So the gene that existed that long yeah, ago. Yeah, so we right? don't need that, though, so. because it's a back, back uh, calculation, right? So think about it. Let's say I give all of you a painting of the Mona Lisa. It's yeah. awesome. It's beautiful. But then I give you all a little bit of paint. So you can actually sprinkle paint. Each of you are going to do it. Each of you are going to make different imprints on that genome, on, on that picture. And based on the fact that each of you are, by definition, making different splotches on that painting, I can perfectly back calculate what the original Mona Lisa looked like. I don't need a crown group at all. Um, I don't need any information about an ancestor. In this case, we did have access to the rhesus peter, which is more ancient. But actually, we didn't use that at all in our calculation. So you look at the gene parts which are actually preserved across? Uh, so we are basically, essentially for each nucleotide, we construct a, a tree, and we estimate the ancestor, and we just slide a window, and we construct the ancestor across the entire alignment based on the fact that the original Mona Lisa existed and was used to uh, make all of these splotchy virgins. Yeah. Uh, so um, there was a uh, statement which mentioned that the ancestors, uh, ha in fact, have an impact over the in viral infections that we face. Uh, let us take the uh, example of Epstein-Barr virus. We have uh, patients who give uh, no symptoms. We have people who develop cancers uh, in comparison with Hodgkin's lymphoma. Then we have uh, children younger than five years who eventually die. Now, uh, despite being one uh, similar virus, one same virus, why do we have so much difference in the infections even though we were inherited from one single ancestor? So that's an excellent question. Two answers to that. Firstly, they are not the same virus. Now, people have been doing a lot of sequencing from Burkitt's lymphoma and from these things, and it's very clear that the virus has variation, even though it's not like as dramatically different in HIV strains from different continents, it is different. But the biggest thing actually there has to do with host immunity. And host immunity is very different. And we are, in fact, and others are doing GWAS studies to be able to identify uh, in uh, populations that where you have a clear transmission 
or to Hodgkin's lymphoma or to EBV, to Burkitt's, you basically are able to make some connections with some key immunity genes that are distinct. Uh, and and you know, so work is ongoing in order to do that. But host genetic variation plays a huge role. It's the same thing with malaria, right? So host genetic variation is like one of the key determinants to why people living in the same you know, population, some of them are highly uh, immune to the malaria parasite and others are highly susceptible to uh, cerebral malaria. And it comes down to those, in those cases, we know the genes, so the story is quite simple. In EBV, we are just about to start discovering those genes. But there is a huge role to be played for host genetic variation. Yeah, that's a very good question. So there's an online question uh, that we just saw. How do these ancient viruses get lost over the years? I mean, due to medical research, environmental changes? How, so the, so the, the process of mutation is a chemical process that involves making nucleotide substitutions, but also deletions. The, the longer, longer you're basically unused, the more likely it is that you're just abrading away. I'm not saying that they're completely lost. They probably exist, but they are now beyond our power of detecting them. That's where the, I think the 50% of the genome comes from. They are probably ancient viruses. They probably sort of are there because they're not actually providing any junk, but our ability to say, aha, that came from an ancient virus is now much, much lower. People are doing sophisticated uh, HMM models to go deeper into that. David Pollock from Colorado has made some nice models to go deeper into that fuzzy space. But uh, it's been of mixed success. In some cases, it's been very successful. In other cases, not so much. Yeah. So we'll have the last question by Professor Chandra. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so on this host genetic variation and retroviral imprints, I don't know if you already mentioned it. I walked in a few minutes late. Um, is there uh, ethnicity, uh, is ethnicity a factor at all? Is Are ethnicity a factor? Well, the in, in ethnicity variation. would be a factor if you were looking at something that was relatively recent because there's a lot of, in, in, and then there's also this wave of introgression from Neanderthal genomes into certain ethnic groups versus others. So that's a clear example where you would actually, by definition, introduce not only parts of the genome, but also the imprints of those uh, viruses that came from those parts. All the, all the things that I described today, those imprints occurred so long ago that that is not a factor. This is common to all human beings. There's only one endogenous retrovirus that's even polymorphic among, uh, so this is unlike like ALU elements or line one, where in ALU elements, everybody in this room has their own private repertoire of uh, ALU elements. These are not actively jumping in the human population, so there's no private repertoire. So Ancestry.com wouldn't be interested in... Not, not at all. Yeah, unfortunately. I would love to have another source of grant funding. Yeah. Okay, so with that light note, let's... Uh, you have a question? Okay, so with that light note, let's just thank uh, Harmit for a wonderful talk. All right, thank you. I'm sorry, many of you raised your hands, but you can catch him during coffee. So let's yeah. go for cup. <laughs>